How different is sunlight distribution in conventional and passive house buildings? I am a passive house trainer, have been involved in the training of more than 500 practitioners over the past decade. Many workshop practitioners' imaginations seem to fail when it comes to designing effective shading devices. In previous videos, I focused on the effective shading of east and west facades. Also looked at different techniques for using third-party tools to assess patterns of shade and shadow. In this video, let's turn to the occupant's perspective when we consider patterns of radiation inside buildings. Let's see how patterns differ between conventional residents with little or no shading, and after we add some overhangs, as well as a facade with a mix of shading devices and east-west adjustments typical of a building following passive house principles. Here's a quick review of the dwelling. It faces cardinal directions, includes an open plan kitchen, lounge and dining room on the ground level, two bedrooms and a study and bath on the upper level. The conventional design includes little in the way of solar protection. Next, we look at a variant which includes a bit of an overhang on three of the facades. As we saw in that earlier video, overhangs tend to have very little impact on the east and west facades. And lastly, passive house designs, the extreme design goals, often constrain glazing to the north, east, and west. In this case, we're going to constrain the glazing at the stair and the dining area, we're also going to include some vertical shading on the east and west facades because that's rather more effective than overhangs. Facade details are also different. The conventional design has a concrete block with a brick skin. It's roughly 275 millimeters thick. The higher performance facade is roughly 485 millimeters thick. Therefore, the aperture difference will impact insulation patterns within the rooms. As with the prior video, shade and shadows are predicted by way of radiance. Of course, one could actually just use a physical model to get early warnings about non-optimal facades. Let's track shade, shadow, and insulation patterns on the ground level of the conventional dwelling on a July day. As we see, the facade does little to constrain solar radiation entering rooms at this time of year. This will likely result in excess solar heat gains at a time of the year when such gains could lead to overheating. Notice in particular that the dining area has lots of insulation in the morning, and the stair at the northwest corner is also the source of considerable radiation late in the afternoon. Next, we'll look at patterns after minimum overhangs have been added. For the south facade, we can see some changes. However, constraining the overhang to the width of the window it seems to limit its efficacy. For the east and west facades, the sun patches are largely unchanged and therefore the risk of overheating is also much the same. And now we look at a high performance facade. Early in the morning and late afternoon, the vertical shading is not particularly effective, but we do see differences for several hours near midday. The thicker facade, however, does quite a lot to constrain the light that's entering the rooms. Restricting the area of glass near the dining room, as well as at the stair, also reduces the solar impact for the passive house design. Of course, knowing the location and timing of sun patches on interior building surfaces can give us clues as to options we might take to further improve the thermal and visual comfort within buildings. And we'll cover that 
in further videos.